Hey there. Welcome to this tutorial on classes. Now if you want to know the difference between classes and structs, which they are very similar, we talked about those differences in the last tutorial. So I'm just going to hop right into creating a class so that you can see what's happening here. How do you define a class in Swift? Well, let's create a boring class. And that's it. That's defining a class in Swift. And it's a valid class too. You can see there's no errors. The only difference between this class and the struct that we created is that you would replace this keyword class with the word struct and you would have a struct instead of a class. Let's create another class, except this time let's add some properties to make it a little more interesting. We'll create a car. Now this car is going to have a model and by default that's going to be a blank string. And the car is also going to have a year and we're going to define a default value of zero to that and that will work just fine. I wonder what happens if we take out the default values for these. Now we know for sure that we at least need to give the model in the year a type so the model is going to be a string so we know it's not going to work unless we at least give it a type and the year is also going to be an int. So that should work but we still have an error. This is saying that the car class has no initializers. That's what it says over here. And the reason is because structs give you an initializer on their own. Remember that's called member-wise initializers. But classes, you have to write the initialization yourself. And these variables would not get initialized at this point. So we're not setting a default value. We do need to notify the compiler that we intend to store the variable um, by giving it a type explicitly, which we did do. So that's why you can't just write var model. That will definitely give you uh, an error on its own. So we say that the model has to be a string. And then the car class has to have its own initializer. Otherwise, it's not going to work at all. And let's say we change this class from a car to a person class, and we're going to add a constant here called name because we can assume that the name of the person is not going to change. And let's say that we also have an age of the person which is going to be an integer. And let's say that we also have a nickname which is going to be a string. Now let's create our initializer. You write in it and then in that you define the order that these properties are going to get initialized in. So we'll first do our name, which has to be a string, and we'll do our age, which is going to be an integer. And then because they may not write the nickname, we'll make the nickname an optional. That's going to be a string optional. So by you put that question mark at the end, and that's going to default to nil. And then here we'll just assign everything, self.name, is equal to name. And this is saying that name belongs to the person class. And this name here is referring to the name in the parameters. So then we're going to have self.age is equal to age. And then we're going to have self.nickname is equal to nickname. Now we do need to assign the nickname up here to be an optional string. Otherwise, the types don't match. So now that got rid of the error. And we notice that we have the keyword self, which is differentiating between the parameters that are used in the init method, like name here, age here, and nickname, and the properties of the actual class. We're going to assume that not everybody will have a nickname, so we want the nickname to be able to be optional. So because that variable is an optional, it's defaulted to nil. We don't need to include it in our initializer, but because it might be useful to also set the nickname during the initialization, we're going to include it in, and give it a default value explicitly set to nil. So it's completely up to the user if they want to include that in the initialization. So check this out. Let's create a new person here. We're going to create a var person1, and of course that's going to be of type person. Now we don't need to declare that because Swift is going to know that this is a person by saying person. 
and you can see that it needs a name, age, and nickname, and it has to be in that order. So we're going to give the name as John, the age as 26, and we're going to leave the nickname off. And you can see that it doesn't complain. And we can create a person too. This person's name is going to be Fred, and his age is going to be 36, and his nickname is going to be T-Bone. The way that we access these properties that we just set for the people is the same way that we access the properties in the structs that we talked about in the last tutorial. So we can say person1.age, and you can see over here that that came back as 26. Now the only thing we haven't done yet is we haven't subclassed anything. We haven't shown you how to do inheritance in Swift. And you'll notice that we didn't have to define a subclass up here, which sometimes you have to do in other languages. So let's do that and let's subclass this person. We're going to create another class called mutant. And this mutant is going to extend from the person class. You can see the way that we did that is we use that colon and then we type the name of the class we want it to extend from. And we're going to give this mutant a couple of properties. One is going to be a level. And let's say that we also give the mutant a superpower, which is going to be a type string. And then we need to initialize. That's what this error is, is because they're not being initialized. We're going to create an init. And you notice that it automatically suggests the properties from our person class. So we'll leave all those in. Now, because nickname is defaulted to nil, we have to leave that last. But we'll also add in our other properties here, level, which is an int, and superpower, which is a string. Because nickname is defaulted to nil because it has a default, we need to leave it as the last one. So here we're going to do self.level is equal to level. And we're going to do self.superpower is equal to superpower. Now, how are we going to set the person nickname and all those things that they would have set for the person? Well, what we can do is we can call super.init, and we can apply the name here and the age here and the nickname here. And that will apply those properties to the person class. And then we'll just define one function, which is going to be a method of the mutant class is more powerful. We'll give it a mutant that we want to test if it's more powerful than, and it's going to return a bool. And all we have to do is we just have to test if the level of this mutant, the level of the current mutant we're in, is greater than the mutant that we're testing against. So level is greater than mutant.level. And there's our class. So this followed almost the exact same conventions that we made in our original class. In the init, you'll notice that we uh, set the values of the properties that the subclass declares. And then after we set our properties of the mutant, we called the superclasses initializer right here. After that, we would do anything else that we needed to do in this class, something down here. If you try to do that out of order, then the compiler will give you a warning. We're now ready to use our mutant class. So let's check it out. So let's make Jim the mutant. And we're going to set Jim's name to be Jim Neutron, who is age 23. His level is 7. His superpower is, let's say, Flight. And his nickname is Flying Jim. And we're going to create one more mutant. This is Janet. Janet the mutant. So her name is, let's see, let's make sure that the name is a string. Janet Jackson. She is age 32. Her level is 8. Her superpower is telepathy. 
and she also sings. Her nickname is the Brainiac, not the Brianiac. <laughs> she could also be the Brianiac. So let's test our method here. Let's see if Janet is stronger than Jim or Jim is stronger than Janet. So we can say Janet dot is more powerful than Jim. And that returns back true. That's because Janet's level eight is greater than Jim's level seven. So that's pretty cool. Up here we created this function is more powerful and we're able to access that from instances of the class. There's another type of function that you can define called the class method and it's exactly the same as the one we defined except in front of the word function you write the word class and this isn't just called the class method you can also call it the type method so I'll show you that down here. Class, some class, and we do class function type method and it's going to be passed a string which is a string and it's going to return a string as well and then what we can do is we can return string plus modified in class method. The type method doesn't require the creation of an instance to be useful. In other languages, I believe you would call this a static method. So right here we can say some class dot type method. So you see we don't even need an instance of some class to do this and let's create a uh, string to modify which we haven't created yet so we'll say var string to modify is going to be a string it's going to be equal to happy string happy string so over here you can see that happy string underscore modified in class method and we can even change this live and spell it correctly isn't that amazing? So in other programming languages, you would call this a, a static method or a class method. In Swift, we call this a type method. So up to this point, we've covered the basic class functionality in Swift, and we talked about class type instances. So up to this point, we've covered some core class functionality in Swift. Now we just need to talk a little bit about how class type instances are retained. If you remember from the last tutorial, we talked about structs. We said that they were a quote value type but this means that they're always copied when they're passed as an argument or as an assignment to a different variable etc but class instances they function a little bit differently they are uh, reference counted so this means that you can actually have multiple variables or constants that could have references to the same instance of a class I'll show you a simple example right now so I'm going to delete everything we can always control Z to get back to it. Let's create a class called simple class. I love that this is already a valid class. So we're going to create a property here called string property. I know it's very creative, right? My string. So there's our entire class. Now we can say let's create a constant called uh, variable one which is of type simple class and that's going to be equal to a new simple class so now variable one has an instance of simple class now we can say variable one dot string property is equal to hello world now what happens if we create another variable that references that instance check this out Let's create variable two, which is also going to be a simple class. It's not going to be equal to a new simple class. It's going to be equal to variable one. So we don't actually have to do this type declaration here because Swift is smart enough to take care of that. So now at this point, variable one and variable two both point to the same instance of the simple class in memory. 
If we modify one, what do you think is going to happen? Well, the value that's associated with both variable changes. When we assign variable one to variable two, there's no new initialization of simple class going on. It's just adding a reference to the already existing instance. We only created a new instance right here when we did the open and close parentheses. So check this out. Let's see what happens when we change some things up. So if we do variable one dot string property is equal to changed. And then we do variable two dot string property. We can see that it also equals changed because variable two is referencing variable one. So when you change something on variable one, you're essentially changing it on variable two except you're not, you're actually just changing it on the reference that variable one and variable two both point to. So I'm gonna tell you one other thing that uh, you can do which is really cool. In the last tutorial, we talked about structs. Now we are talking about classes. You can have a struct that is a property of a class. A popular struct that you may know about is the CG rect from Objective C. So let's pull that in here. I believe we need to import this yes so there's our cg rect is equal to cg rect and we're going to assign the 0 0.0 0 0.0 the width will make it 100 and the height will make it 100 so now we have a struct that is a property of a class and we can actually instantiate the class and modify the struct internally from the reference of the class. So we could say var new simple class is equal to simple class. And we can say new simple class dot rect dot size dot height is equal to 200. So now when we say new simple class dot rect dot size dot height we get 200 so we're actually modifying a struct which is internal to the class so we can create a variable for that rect we can say rect is equal to the new simple class dot rect and now we have a reference to the struct now if we were to say rect dot size dot width is equal to 200 and we were to say new simple class dot rec is equal to rect because structs are always copied and classes are passed by reference so we need to reassign this now this would seem to be cumbersome and maybe it's a little unnatural feeling the good news is with Swift we don't have to do this anymore we can actually just say new simple class dot size dot width not size we'd have to say rect dot size dot width and we can also say new simple class dot rect dot origin dot y is equal to 10 and now we can say uh, new simple class dot rect and we have all the properties that we set from before and this is actually an upgrade in Swift versus Objective-C, you weren't able to do something like this. So that's all for this tutorial. I'll see you in the next tutorial.